Good evening, everybody. I can't Welcome. tell. My name is uh, Eddie Pong from the Executive Director of Mahon Adar. We're really so glad to see all of you here tonight, and I want to welcome you to the largest event that Mahon Adar has ever hosted. Thank you for being here. We have close to 400 people here, as well as 60 people who are online watching on the live stream. Welcome to online. Um, I wanted to welcome all the folks who have been to a Hadar event in the past, and also for the many folks who are here for the very first time. Uh, it's really an honor to have you here, especially in this busy season. Um, and I look forward to seeing all of you at some of the other programming that we have throughout the year. Um, I want to make a special thank you to our uh, partners in this program, to Central Synagogue, to Romamu and to Limu, New York. Thank you for all of your help and effort getting the word out. Um, we'd also like to thank Lincoln Square Synagogue for opening their home to us in this very busy time uh, and, and welcoming us to their synagogue in the round. Um, uh, just a brief word about Mechon Hadar. We are an educational institution that empowers Jews to create and sustain vibrant, practicing, egalitarian communities of Torah learning, prayer, and service. And that is why we're so honored to have all of you at tonight's program and many others like this one where denominational lines don't matter and we can all come together to learn. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the program. Um, first off, I'm going to ask you to silence your cell phones. So if you could please do that, that would be a big help. Um, the format is going to work as follows. Rabbi Tulishkin is going to speak for 15 minutes. <laughs> And then Rabbi Held is going to speak for 15 minutes. And this will be followed by about a half an hour of back and forth right here at these chairs. And then there will be time for, for questions um, from the audience, which you can use those uh, index cards um, to fill out with questions. Rabbi Held and Rabbi Talishka will be signing copies of their books out in the lobby after the formal program ends. Um, and we'll be dominating Marv um, next door at, at Hadar 190 in Amsterdam for those who are interested after the program. Uh, I should note one word of caution, even though you're all here tonight, this does not exempt you from listening to your rabbi's sermon on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. <laughs> I want to turn over uh, the program to Mark Schiller, a longtime friend of Hadar and board member of Romumu, to formally introduce our speakers. Thank you, Aaron. thank you. My uh, wife Karen and I are delighted to be here tonight and to represent Romumu as one of the co-sponsors of the event. In a recent conversation I had with Rabbi David, who mentioned to me that repentance and return and forgiveness came even before the creation of the world. Clearly that's because we couldn't have a world without the ability to return and to repair. And maybe that's why there are so many of us here tonight, to better understand how to forgive and to be forgiven. And who better to help us with that than such two important Torah leaders of uh, today, Rabbi Shai Held, who Fortunate to know personally, he's the co-founder and dean and chair of Jewish Club of Mahon Hadar. He's been working tirelessly to give us weekly parsha notes, although we're getting, he's getting a break from that. Ethan's about to take over. We can see how happy he is for that. Um, he's been a recipient of numerous awards and been named multiple times to Newsweek's list of top 50 rabbis. Joining him tonight is uh, Rabbi Joseph Tolushkin, a well-known author, rabbi, and speaker. He's also the author of uh, Jewish Literacy, the Most Important Things to Know About Jewish Religion, Its People, and Its History, which according to my cheat sheet, which I have not verified, is the most widely sold book I've used in the past two decades. So um, that's an important thing to know. But for tonight's purposes, his most important credential is that his daughter Shira is an alum of Mahal Hadar. So I'm delighted to have both of them. Please join me in welcoming these two people. We hurt each other in social interactions, we hurt each other in familiar interactions, and as 
a general rule, forgiveness should be dependent on the offending party's repentance. And what's the prophetic book that we read on Yom Kippur? One of those that we read, of course, is the book of Jonah. And that's considered a model of repentance by Yara Hashem, Kishavu, and And God saw that they turned from the reason path. When people sometimes try and consider the uh, tension between the particular and the universal in Judaism, it is fascinating that the model of repentance on Yom Kippur is the non Jews of, of Nineveh. Some years ago, I sat down to work on a code of Jewish. I just want to check the time, because I told everyone I have to look here in my 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, which is unfortunate because I wanted to do a brief overview of the 613 <laughs> Some years ago, when I sat down to work on a code of Jewish ethics, I decided, since I had been speaking on issues of ethics uh, for a while, I didn't want to just end up repeating things that I already said. So I sat down and decided to try and research from the beginning. And I did it the old-fashioned way I did when I was a young a high school student with note cards. And when I was assembled about 100 note cards or so, I started trying to categorize them. And it occurred to me that when I came to the issue of forgiveness, categories presented themselves. There are times when Jewish law and forgiveness is mandatory. There are times when it is optional. And if one can speak of an innovative feature in Judaism, there are times when forgiveness is actually forbidden. When is it mandatory? Usually in two categories. When the hurt that you can, that, that when the hurt that one has experienced is not irreparable, and when somebody sincerely asks for forgiveness. Now, even if a hurt is not irrevocable, it doesn't mean that it might not be extremely painful. It might not always be easy to forgive. But if somebody has hurt you and the hurt is not irrevocable and they sincerely ask for forgiveness, you're commanded to do so. But what are you supposed to do if you don't really feel that you can forgive? If you're still angry, you have to work on yourself. A person is obligated to ask for forgiveness. How many of you happen to know? How many times are you obligated to ask for forgiveness? Three. And after that, you're not supposed to ask anymore. It becomes humiliating, self-abasing. It can become painful. So there are instances. I came across a Rabbi Eliyahu Lothian in, in England. Who somebody came and said, "I really had said, I really had done something very negative uh, to you." Lopian didn't know what he was talking about, so he insisted that the man tell him what he had done. And the man was embarrassed and said, can you just forgive me and not make me tell you what I did? And Lopian said, I can't forgive if I don't know what I'm forgiving. So he told him, and Lopian said, you know what, that really is a serious matter. He said, give me two weeks. He said, I want to study Musser texts, you know, texts of ethical self-improvement, and then come. And when he came back in two weeks, he was able to fully forgive the man. So sometimes we really have to work on ourselves to let go of it. But we're obligated to try and forgive. Then there are times when forgiveness is optional. What are the times when forgiveness is optional? There are basically two things. When the hurt that was inflicted was irrevocable, and when the person who hurt you hasn't asked for forgiveness. Should you forgive in instances, let's say, where somebody didn't ask? And what does it mean to forgive in instances like that? And particularly if the hurt was very deep. What would be an example of an irrevocable hurt? Well, we can imagine a physically irrevocable hurt. You know, somebody gets drunk, drives a car, and inflicts some injury from which you can never really fully recover. Under Jewish law, you are not obligated to forgive. An example given in the Talmud is where somebody besmirches your name. And the reason that's an irrevocable hurt is because even if the person comes to realize that what they've said is not true, so obviously they should then go to everybody to whom they said it and tell the people it's not true. But it's unlikely they'll remember everybody to whom they said it. And it's unlikely that all the people to whom they call will remember the people to whom they said it. So defaming a person is also considered an irrevocable hurt. An irre irrevocable damage that you're not required to do. In the 19th century, there was a scholar who was known as Rosalman of Vilna. When he was a young kid on Yom Kippur, 
he once heard two people speaking in the row in back of him, and one asked the other one for forgiveness, and the other person, obviously they were both fairly knowledgeable Jews, said, no, you really damaged my name, and according to the Talmud, I'm not obligated to forgive you, and I won't. So Reb Zalman revealed his erudition and his insight. He quoted a Gemara in Baba Metzia, a Gemara in the, one of the standard yeshivish uh, uh, yeshiv tractates, that says what was one of the reasons Jerusalem was destroyed. Now, if I threw this open to the crowd, probably many of you would answer, Sinatina, causeless hatred. But here we have an instance where clearly we're not talking about causeless hatred. This man was really angry. His name had been dismerged. One of the other answers the rabbis give to that question is an unexpected one. He says because they based all their rulings on Dean Torah, that they ruled strictly according to the letter of the law. So you wouldn't think that's such a terrible thing. So Zalman said to the man, he said, you're right, according to the letter of the law, you don't have to forgive this man. But then be aware, God will then judge you according to the letter of the law. You're showing up in shul on Yom Kippur, and you're probably asking God for mercy, but you're not showing mercy to him. So if you're going to demand the standard of the letter of the law, then understand that you should expect that God will treat you the same way. He wanted to influence it. Is there an advantage to forgiving in instances where forgiveness is really something optional? Now, by the way, some of you, I've always said the Jewish prayer book is not a zero-sum game. By which I mean that when prayers got added, if they had made a ruling 2,000 years ago, you can add new prayers to the sitter, but every time you add a new prayer, you have to take away another. The service might not have gotten quite as long as the service evolved. So, for example, if I may ask by a showing of hands, I won't embarrass anybody, but I'm just curious for myself. How many of you say the Shema before you go to sleep at night? Okay, it's a very common. The most unexpected answer I ever heard to that question, one person I would not have thought said it, once in an interview, Mike Wallace revealed that he used to say the Shema. Now, many people, how many of you, when you say the Shema at night, literally just say that first puzzle, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elkeinu Hashem Afad? And how many of you say the whole uh, series of prayers? If you look at Art Scroll, it's now eight pages, the Shema you're supposed to say before you go to sleep at night. And uh, one of the great advantages of it, by the way, is that if you actually say it, by the time you finish, you can easily fall asleep. <laughs> One of the prayers in the nighttime Shema is a prayer about trying to go to bed in a forgiving mood. And for reasons that will become apparent in a couple of minutes, it clearly was a, a, a Kabbalistic prayer. But you're supposed to say before you go to sleep, Hareini mochel, I hereby mochel v'salach, I hereby for pardon and forgive, l'chol mi she'echis, anybody who angered me or hurt me or ignitoti, Anybody who sinned against me, whether against my body, whether against my money. By the way, if you forgive somebody who cheated you in money, you still have the right to pursue it legally. You're, uh, you know, you're not, but you are forgiving, you know, you're not maintaining that anger, whether they hurt Fodi, they honor, or other things. Why do I say we know it's a capitalistic prayer? Here's the unexpected element in it. Bain begilgul zeh, bain begilgul acher. Whether somebody hurt me in this lifetime or in a previous lifetime. And uh, that's one of the, how many of you, by the way, are open to a belief in reincarnation? Okay, I definitely am, and it helps explain why some of you look very familiar to me. <laughs> even, uh, even though I don't think that I know each other. What could be some of the reasons why it's wise to forgive? even in instances where forgiveness is optional. And I'm going to relate it through two stories that I've heard over the years. One from Harold Kushner, I think we're both friends with, and one from Abraham Tversky. Has, has Rabbi Tversky, by the way, spoken to us? Well, actually, I was going to say here at Lincoln Square, but I realize you're here, not necessarily as Lincoln Square members, or at Hadar, but I commend you, if you can, to get him at Hadar. Tversky is from a Hasidic dynasty. He's a Hasidic rabbi. He's also a psychiatrist. Tversky became a doctor in the early 60s and became a psychiatrist and his area of specialization was addictive behavior. And in the early 60s, addictive behavior generally referred to alcoholism. By the late 60s, addictions were referring increasingly also to drugs 
And today, addictive behavior is used to describe a whole series of self-destructive behaviors in which human beings engage. So Tversky, to this day, that remains his area of specialty. He, he worked in a lot of other areas. He himself has written 60 books. As he once said to me, he says, writing books is my addiction. <laughs> and, uh, but he was once speaking to a recovering alcoholic. I mean, once. He spoke to recovering alcoholics all the time. What's the obvious problem confronting recovering alcoholics? How to resist that first drink? Because the problem of alcoholics is they can't control their drinking. And so this recovering alcoholic said to Tversky, he said he had to analyze what was it that caused him to suddenly take a drink. And he realized that the most common impetus for it was, was when he was in a conflict, when he was very angry with somebody. And he couldn't start, stop thinking about it. The sort of thing that often happens to us when you wake up in the middle of the night, you have to go to the bathroom, and then you're so angry at somebody else, you can't fall back asleep. You know, you can't stop thinking about it. You're sitting at your desk, you're trying to work, and then you think, oh, I should say this to them, I should say that to them. And he said, so what would end up happening is I would take a drink to calm down, and then, of course, it would trigger a whole series of unfortunate behaviors. So he said, I had to learn to control my grudges. Because he said he realized, if you don't control your grudges, he said a person... Oh God, I mean, he said a brilliant thing that just slipped out of my mind. Carrying around a grudge is like allowing the person in the world who you most dislike to live in your mind rent free. <laughs> Carrying around a grudge is like allowing the person who you most dislike to live in your mind rent free. Why would anybody do that? So one of the impetuses to forgive, even in those instances where it's optional, is exactly that. You don't want your life to be dominated. Harold Kushner told me of a similar incident. A woman in her... By the way, I am conscious of the 15 minutes. Okay. I now have spoken, I see, for two and a half minutes. <laughs> Kushner... You know, Kushner uh, told me of an incident. There was a woman in his congregation whose husband had left her in a... He left her for another woman in a very mean-spirited way, and then and then it was terrible in the negotiations, financially, and, and, and a bad father then to his own children. And Kushner said he was not surprised the woman was enraged. But what did upset him a little was, was that 10 years later, her rage was utterly unabated. And he said to her, you've been walking around for 10 years with a hot coal in your hand, ready to throw it at your ex-husband, and all you've ended up doing is burning a hole in your hand. So sometimes it can really be advantageous to us for our own willing to learn to let go of some of that anger. My wife, Deborah, has made the point. There's a very important addendum to it. There's a story they tell about the Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter. As you can imagine, from the time I was a kid, I always found that name fascinating. Well, I mean, what does it mean? All it means is that his family came from Frankfurt. And of course, what did they call you if your family came from Hamburg? A hamburger. I always thought if a child of Frankfurter married somebody from the hamburger family, <laughs> Wedding invitations. The Frankfurters and the Hamburgers would like to invite you to a barbecue. <laughs> anyway, Frankfurter once had a conflict with somebody. The question was raised when they finally resolved it. So are you willing to forgive and forget? He said, I'm willing to forgive. But to ask you to forget is to ask you not to learn from experience. It can be hard to reconcile. And the point that my wife, the Bora, has made is, even if you're willing to forgive in those instances where it's optional, or where the person hasn't asked for forgiveness, if you want to have an enduring relationship with the person, you should tell them how they hurt you. Because she said she's been surprised in her own life when she has told people how they have hurt them, and the people had no idea that they had done so. We tend to ascribe nasty motives often to other people. Because we tend to judge other people by their actions, and we tend to judge ourselves by our intentions. So we might have hurt other people, but we might not think our motives were so terrible. So anyway, so she said, when you tell the person how they hurt you, they can really express uh, a sorrow over, the, over having done so. And in that instance, there can really be a reconciliation and room for the relationship to resume. And I've pretty much exhausted my time. I'll just say very briefly, there are times the innovative feature of Jewish law, maybe we'll get to it later, is when you can't forgive, and that is you can't forgive harm done to another person. And you might think that's, what's the Kiddush? You know, what's the new insight there? 
Who would say you could forgive harm? No, in, in Christianity, and I'm not being judgmental here, I'm just saying that there are different approaches, there's a much greater openness uh, to such forgiveness. Uh, I'll just, no, you know what, I'll, I'll say other things about that later, it'll come up. But in the meantime, so even in instances where it's optional, there are reasons why it can be very good to learn how to forgive, and we'll have more time to dialogue about on this. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi Tulishman. Thank you all for being here. I was reminded, thankfully, of the old joke. What does it mean when a congregational rabbi looks at his watch? Nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> We're here to talk about forgiveness. I figure I should do something wrong first. But what I would like to try and do um, is to talk about briefly two competing impulses in Jewish thought around forgiveness, one of which is extremely well known, and one of which is virtually completely unknown. And I'll say as a preface, I'm going to try to talk a little bit in a kind of more philosophical mode, and then the human dimension will be what we talk about extensively in a few minutes. So the dominant mainstream presentation of Jewish ethics around forgiveness, um, as you've already heard, is that one is obligated to forgive when, and only when, the offender asks for forgiveness. If you have the sheet in front of you, you can look at the most well-known source for this, the Mishnah on Babakama, that says, from where do we know that when someone asks for forgiveness, you should forgive them? From the story of Abraham and Abimelech, Abraham has to pray on behalf of this man who has mistreated him and his wife once, the rabbinic understanding here is, once Abimelech apologized, although that's not explicit in the text. Okay? That is the classic Jewish presentation. Although I should say, this text alone leaves many questions open. One is not required to forgive someone who has not asked for forgiveness. But is one permitted to do so? Is it even desirable to do so? The Mishnah says nothing about that at all. But there is another strain in Jewish thought, which is almost never spoken of at all. And that's what you find in Source 2. And it's fascinating. This is the Tosefta, another rabbinic text from the same era, which says, how do we know that if someone hurts me, even if they have not apologized, I am obligated to forgive them? Lo and behold, from Abraham and Abimelech. Right? These two texts read that biblical story totally differently. One assumes that Abraham will have an obligation to forgive Abimelech and pray on his behalf when and only when Abimelech apologizes. The other text assumes Abraham has a blanket obligation to forgive. And by the way, not just to forgive, the rabbis up the ante here to pray for mercy on someone's behalf is a very dramatic demand. One really needs to have one's heart in it to do that. The same biblical story obviously is being read in two different ways. That would be its own fascinating discussion about how to understand that story. So on this account, we're asked to forgive regardless of whether or not we've been asked to do so by the offender. Now, what is striking, I think, is how dramatically opposed they are. These are diametrically opposed presentations. And I do think, by the way, that it's interesting to ask why one of these approaches is so well-known and so frequently cited, and the other one is sort of muted and mainly forgotten in Jewish culture. But I'm, I'm interested now in the question of how can we make sense of these two voices in the Jewish tradition? And I want to acknowledge my debt here. What I'm about to say is almost entirely indebted to Professor Lewis Newman from Carleton College, who has, a, has had a lot of really interesting things to say about the ethics and theology of forgiveness in Judaism. And he says something completely fascinating. He says the Mishnah, source one, that is, this source that says, I am obligated to forgive when someone apologizes, that is what happens when I see the world through midat hadith, through a lens focused on justice. But the Tosefta, in contrast, the position that I am obligated to pray on behalf of someone who hurt me, even if he or she does not apologize, is what happens when I see the world through midat hachesed through the lens of, I'll translate here, 
mercy, through the lens of mercy. If our primary perspective on the world is the lens of justice, then forgiving someone who has not apologized may actively be a detrimental thing to do. I am upending the moral order of things. I am undermining the way the world is supposed to work. If you want to be forgiven, says the lens of justice, you have to do something to make amends in the world and fix things. Right? That's what justice teaches us. But the Josefta, in contrast, is what happens when I see the world through the lens of mercy. If I see the world through the lens of mercy, then forgiveness is something I might be willing to grant much more freely. In fact, I may not only be willing to grant it, I may be actively eager to grant it. And the interesting question, I think, is why, and this dovetails directly with something Rabbi Kalishman said. Since we believe that God sees the world through a perspective of mercy, we too strive to do the same. I'll complicate that in just a moment. Um, now, if you look at source three, you'll see, I don't want to read this at length, but this rabbinic text basically says, just as God um, is long-suffering with the wicked and accepts them in repentance, etc., you are also not to seek to impose punishments on people. In other words, living from the perspective of mercy becomes a form of imitatio dei, of imitating God. We're supposed to emulate the ways of God in the world, and one of them here is, just as God is graciously forgiving, so also should we. But wait a minute. Isn't God, according to Judaism, also committed to justice? Isn't that, after all, a major piece of what Hamash, what the Pentateuch and the prophets teach? This, I think, is a fascinating window into rabbinic theology. One of the things that is really striking is I'm aware of no classical rabbinic source that says, just as God enacts justice, so should you. Fascinatingly, when the rabbis, when the Talmudic rabbis understand what the halakhah, what it means to walk in God's ways is, they always emphasize empathy, compassion, and mercy. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that they are uninterested in justice. But it means that somehow, one could spend a long time trying to understand this, unfortunately rabbis don't write diaries, explain to us what motivates them to read texts in certain ways, but right, it's always very striking. Nowhere in rabbinic literature do you have the idea, just as God gets angry and smites his enemies, so too should you, right? But instead, you have just as God is merciful and compassionate and visits the sick and comforts the, the mourners, etc., so should you. And here, the centrality of imitating God's mercy first and foremost, I think, comes to the fore in this Tosefta, right? If you want to be like God, if you want to worship God, on some level, you should be like God, or strive to in any way, in any case. And of course, the realization that I myself need mercy would move me to be willing to bequeath it to others. There's all kinds of Jewish sources from all kinds of periods that say you cannot show up in shul and beg God for mercy while being utterly merciless. And by the way, for many years I thought that that was a kind of moralistic statement, meaning you have no right, but I suspect that something else is at play also, which is a deep psychological insight. If I am in a posture of being fundamentally clothed to generosity that I bestow, I will also be unable to receive it. It is impossible to genuinely receive graciousness without being willing also to bestow it. So it is a moral claim, but it's also a psychological insight. So I want to close with this. Which one is it? How should we think about what we are engaged in in a journey of forgiveness? Do we follow the Mishnah and say, I will only forgive if and when you come and apologize to me? Or should we follow the Tosefta and say, my goal is to open my heart to such an extent that I forgive you whether or not you apologize. And the answer here, I think, is a clear window into Jewish theology. Jewish theology does, is not about justice or mercy. It is always about justice and mercy. In other words, what that means is that it is about living with the tension between these two competing and arguably even contradictory impulses. That is to say, does Judaism say I should forgive one apologize to, or I should forgive? Yeah, exactly, that's what Judaism says. And where it's frustrating is, 
But wait a minute, I want you to tell me what I should do right now. Judaism says, learn to live in a world that's complicated. That's what I'm telling you to do. Negotiate your way through this difficulty. In other words, the tension between justice and mercy is so deep that all we ever are able to do is negotiate with it on a day-by-day, moment-to-moment basis. How does Judaism admit how hard that is? I would say it's actually extremely moving. What does it mean for the rabbis to imagine that God has trouble figuring out whether to sit on the throne of mercy or the throne of justice? The answer, I think, is that that is, among other things, Judaism's way of saying, this is so hard, even God struggles to figure it out. It's really hard to figure this out. When is the right thing to do to say, no, I will not forgive unless you apologize? And there could be a million reasons for that, some of which could be totally selfless, by the way. Some of which could be about educating other people. Some of which could be about me. And, you know, and when does Judaism say, I forgive you as an act of utter grace? You didn't earn it, but like God, I bestow gifts. And I give this gift to you of forgiveness. Even God finds that hard, I think, according to Jewish theology. Now, just literally one last sentence that I find fascinating. It is traditional to say, Judaism believes that you only bestow forgiveness when you are apologized to. As we've seen, that's more complicated. And it is common, especially for Jews, to say that Christianity believes you should bestow forgiveness even when you haven't been apologized to. So I've just tried to show you that Judaism, in fact, says both things. And I'll just mention that a, one, a very prominent Christian ethicist, Anthony Bash, who's written book after book after book about forgiveness, has argued that it is an utter distortion of the Christian tradition to imagine that one is obligated to forgive when one hasn't been apologized to. And his argument is, God accepts the Israelites back when they do tshuva. This is yet another example, those who have heard of me before, of how we're almost always wrong when we imagine that Judaism says this and Christianity says that. Because what we're now seeing is, what people say Judaism says, Judaism also says the opposite thing. And what we imagine Christianity says, Christianity also says the opposite thing. And what that tells you is that this issue is enormously messy and complicated, and neat philosophical resolutions are not available to us in this lifetime. Thank you very much. So shifting gears now into my favorite role, Phil Donahue, um, I want to... Way to sort of go back and forth a little bit, but I want to begin, can you hear me? I want to begin by asking you, Rabbi Zwishkin, to, to reflect on something that I discovered this week that I confess I found to be striking to the point of overwhelming. Um, if you search a database called PsychInfo, which is one of the main databases for psychology research, and you search for articles about forgiveness published prior to the year 1990, you find fewer than two dozen entries. If you search articles in PsychInfo about forgiveness from 1990 to the present, you find 1,100 articles. I want to understand what that is about. What do you make of that? What does it tell us about our culture? I think we've become much more aware in recent years how the carrying around of anger is so detrimental to ourselves. Ironically, I think the search for forgiveness and the desire to understand it better has more to do with the carrying around of anger and the detrimental effect it has on the person who carries it around. I'll give you an example that comes to my mind. I'm going to ask, I always tend to be somewhat interactive when I speak. And how many of your families, at the level of first cousin or closer, are there people not on speaking terms? <laughs> it's, a, it's a staggering thing. I've always, I've always, you know, found that. And it, you know, and later on, if people would get up and explain what the origins of the fight are, they often sound ridiculous. Or you explain it to your children, why people don't speak. So it has a very detrimental effect. And I often plead to people, I have a part-time congregation in LA, very often the last sermon I'll give before the high holidays, I will tell people, I'll ask that question I just asked you, and I'll say, I just want to tell you something. 
I'm a parent. I have, uh, my wife and I, we have four children. There are a few things I can regard as sadder than to imagine that God forbid one day two of my children would not be on speaking terms. So I'd say if you don't speak to a very, uh, to a, a cousin or, or a brother or sister, in a way it's a violation of the fifth commandment. And, uh, and by the way, it is actually detrimental uh, and it's a detrimental to us. So I think what it is, but you probably have some working theory. What do you think is the reason there's such an explosion of articles on forgiveness? The problem is, in this format, if you ask a question, it gets thrown back at you. Um, well, I did uh, give an answer. You did give an answer. No, totally. And I, I agree with that answer. I would only add, I think one of the reasons that that has intensified um, is because of the paradoxical heart to understand condition we live in today, where we are on one level so dramatically hyperconnected and on another level so totally disconnected. And the, year, the yearning for forgiveness, I would understand largely as about a desire to reconnect on deeper levels than most of the time, let's say, for example, Facebook makes possible. Right? On the one level, we're much more connected. I can tell you what high school classmate I haven't seen in 30 years. I can tell you what their kid looked like in going to school for the first day of the year today. All of them, right? <laughs> On the other hand, right, that's not exactly facilitating of like deep human connection. And I wonder whether the preoccupation with forgiveness is another way of manifesting how broken so many of our relationships feel to us. And it reminds me, in a funny way, you know, the, the, the Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh has this amazing story that he tells that when he used to teach meditation in Asia and he wanted to calm a room down, he would say, imagine your mother holding you. And he would feel that, like, the room would get very quiet and calm. He comes to Europe for the first time and he's teaching meditation. He's trying to get people to stop chattering. And he says, imagine mommy is holding you. And he feels this surge of anxiety in the room. <laughs> and he says, I, I, I need some cultural translation. I have no idea what just happened. I don't understand what just happened here. And I wonder whether that is, that's the same thing. It's something about the ways that some deep, almost primal human connections have been, let's say, attenuated, and for many of us, actually broken. Before we go on, I just want to remind people that there are questions you'd like either or both of us to address, you, there are cards and there are pencils going around there also, um, and you will, people will collect them and we'll bring them forward. So let's talk about the relationship between forgiveness on the one hand and reconciliation on the other. One of the things I was very struck by in preparing for tonight is that there is a very sharp divide between when psychologists tend to write about forgiveness and when Christian theologians write about it. When psychologists write about forgiveness, they tend to argue, Robert Enright, very prominent forgiveness researcher, argues this over and over again, forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. And it's extremely important to be able to imagine forgiveness without reconciliation, not least because it enables people to forgive deceased offenders, right, with whom they cannot reconcile, and serial abusers with whom they should not reconcile. So forgiveness may be a crucial step on a road to reconciliation, but it is not the same thing. I can forgive someone and never engage them again. When Christian theologians, on the other hand, write about forgiveness, they are usually very insistent that there is an inextricable bond between forgiveness and reconciliation, such that forgiveness that is not tied to reconciliation is in fact barely forgiveness at all. By the way, one of the arguments they make is biblical and fascinating, which is when God forgives Israel, it is always in the hope of renewed love. God never says to the Israelites in the Bible, I forgive you, have a really good life, but I really need some distance. God says, I want you to apologize, I want to heal this, and then again, we will be together. So I want to ask you, Joseph, do you think Jewish sources so we talk about psychologists and Christian theologians, or for that matter, do you personally have any wisdom to share on that question? What is the relationship between forgiveness and reconciliation? Because I suspect that the biggest obstacle to forgiveness for many people is they don't want to reconcile. They want to find a way to forgive, but it's very hard to tease those two things apart. I would go back to what I spoke of earlier, the point that I said, that my wife had said to me, which I used to leave out. I think 
forgiveness is easier than reconciliation, and I think reconciliation is dependent on the hurt party bring, making it clear in what way that they were hurt. I mean, assuming that there's some objective basis, not just that they're paranoia, you know, or absurdly oversensitive, because otherwise the issues that prompted the first hurts are apt to happening. There has to be for reconcilia reconciliation to work. I think the both parties have to understand what happened and see if there is room for a relationship. I was once sincerely asked for forgiveness by somebody and I did end up reacting in the way that you said if God said I don't want anything more. I had had the unpleasant experience many, many years ago of uh, having gone to a psychiatrist who I found out had gossiped about me, which is a patient's worst horror. But not only had he gossiped about me, he also mixed in some things that were not true, which were reflections of his own thing. It, it could have been very, very damaging to me. I did get revenge on him years ago. <laughs> years ago, I wrote a series of murder mysteries with a rabbinic sleuth. The fact that most of you are surprised to hear that has to do with the fact of why I didn't continue to write murder mysteries to the rabbinic sleuth. But one of them was called uh, The Final Analysis of Dr. Stark, which is about the murder of a gossiping psychiatrist. <laughs> but anyway, he sought me out many years later, and I really at that point was willing to forgive him. But some bond had been broken, and he really wanted to reestablish a relationship. So I, in that, it's a limited instance, because there are really virtually no other instances in my life that I can think of in which I would be unwilling to reconcile. But I think reconciliation, otherwise forgiveness, is a great line. Uh, I have in my original notes that, let me see if I can find it. They both come from uh, two, two of the lines I want to get to. Uh, I'm going to continue talking about something else. Yeah, okay, give me a minute here. Oh, okay, yeah, well, it had to go to the issue that I wanted to speak about where you're, where you're not supposed to forgive. And that's, you know, you can't forgive things done against another. And that's classically associated, of course, with Christianity. But Bonhoeffer, who was, of course, the Lutheran minister and the great anti Nazi fighter, he argued against the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance and he called such forgiveness cheap grace. And Dostoevsky in Brothers Karamazov says, I do not finally want the brother to embrace the tormentor who let his dogs tear her son. I do not want the mother to embrace the tormentor who let his dogs tear her son to pieces. She dare not forgive him. She can forgive for herself if she wants to, but she has no right to forgive the suffering of her child. So I don't know what it means. Does all forgiveness have to lead to reconciliation? Yes, if it doesn't, it doesn't mean that the forgiveness is false, but it means that there has to be a real process, because otherwise you run into the possibility of there being cheap grace. And, and that's what I think it is. Now, one has to be open to allow, though, for it to happen. A friend of mine, I'm trying to personalize it as much without getting overly specific. Uh, like, I can tell you the things I repent. I would like to know all the things you're repenting for this Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. I'm curious, but I'm not going to tell you mine. Okay. I have, uh, no, a friend of mine had hurt me, and he hurt me in, in, in a profound way. He had done something really not nice, and I was angry at him. But at a certain point, I wasn't letting go of the anger, and he got angry at me. You know, and if you don't, I actually think it sounds funny. How many of you grew up in families where you never bought a German product? Okay, I come out of that. I grew up in a family that was very opposed to the reparations agreement uh, with Germany. And uh, ultimately, I think it was good that it came about. Because, let's say Jews had maintained to this day the extraordinary hatred that we, most of us grew up having against Germany. At a certain point, there has to be an allowance. Because remember, number one, all of those Germans basically are dead. There has to be an allowance for some sort of reconciliation to occur, because otherwise people can't go on carrying around the guilt forever, and if you don't open yourself up to any type of reconciliation, they will actually get up angry, we will, uh, getting angry. And so I think that's what we also have to open up, open up ourselves to. You know, as you're talking, I'm reminded of 
that Anthony Bash, who I mentioned before, writes about, which is the kind of thing that philosophers say that, I know this is shocking, he's actually quite helpful. Um, he says that it's really destructive in our culture that we talk about forgiveness and then struggle with 97 different definitions of what that might mean. And he suggests the following simple transformation. He says, rather than talk about forgiveness, we should all begin to talk about forgivenesses. Because there are so many different things that we need, so many different gradations, so many different permutations of reconciliation, non-reconciliation, partial reconciliation. Reconciliation in the sense that I talk to you and we make up, but we agree that we're not going to be close. So all these different things could be called forgiveness. And trying to sort of push them, force them all into one box, and then we then spend our time figuring out which is and which isn't forgiveness, may actually be unhelpful, and we might be better off if we found ways of talking about the different things forgiveness can mean in our life, and the ways that different moments in our life might call for different kinds of forgiveness. One kind of forgiveness might be totally called for, one might be totally inappropriate, right? A woman who has been physically abused by her husband and has finally gotten out might decide that in order to reclaim her inner freedom, she's going to find a way to forgive her husband. Her ex-husband. Husband, ex-husband, right? That's a fascinating question. But we might say that in that case, we would argue reconciliation is extremely dangerous. Right? And do we want to say that in that case, she hasn't forgiven? Or do we want to find more and more complex ways of talking about forgiveness? So I would sort of lay that out as a possibility. I also want to say something that I think is maybe obvious here, but it should be kind of named and stated. One of the things that makes forgiveness so hard for so many of us is how bound up it is with vulnerability. You know, Maimonides actually suggests in the Mishnah Torah that there is not just an obligation to apologize and to forgive one who apologizes, but there is a third obligation, which is to tell someone who's hurt me that they've hurt me such as to invite their apology. That is really hard. Because that basically opens the possibility that the person who has hurt me once will now hurt me again. The person who didn't see me will not see me again. Right? And conversely, reconciliation is only possible on some level through a restoration of trust. That makes me vulnerable to being hurt again. Right? The moments in my life where I've talked to people who have told me about, yeah, so my husband cheated once, and he cried his eyes out, and he begged me for forgiveness, and so I trusted him again. And after the seventh time, I stopped. <laughs> and I, I mean, that's only funny because it's unbearable, right? Um, and that, so I think it's important to name that. And by the way, I, again, I don't want to argue that in every situation, someone should re erase being vulnerable to that particular person. I just want to acknowledge, I think, how much vulnerability is integral to this process, which is part of why it's so complicated for many of us. Sure. Um, yeah. Go ahead. I also want to say forgiveness can have its sort of odd permutations in instances where somebody really can't forgive. I happen to be looking, I know I mentioned him earlier, so my mind was on Harold Kushner, and I remembered a story he had told in his book, How Good Do We Have to Be, where a woman came up to him after services one Shabbat and told her that her father was dying, and, you know, Kushner thought she was going to ask questions about, uh, about sitting Shiva and that, and then she went on, he said, I wasn't prepared, she, what she really wanted to talk about, she said, I won't be sorry when my father dies, I don't want to pretend that I am. He left the family when I was nine years old, he left my mother, he always had girlfriends, and now he left my mother for one of them, my mom had to work two jobs to support us. He never was interested in my high school or college graduation. He refused to pay for my wedding unless I said he could walk me down the aisle, and I told him I couldn't handle that, so he didn't attend. And I haven't spoken to him in the 10 years since. And now, two days ago, his wife, his second wife, called me to tell me he was dying. And she said to Kushner, can you give me a reason why I should mourn for a man like that? Now, obviously, those of you familiar with traditional halacha, the obligation really in such a case would be to mourn, but she really wasn't. So she said, I don't even want to go to the funeral. So look what Kushner said to her. He said, first of all, if you go to the funeral and decide afterwards you made a mistake, that you would have been better off not going, that's just a mistake, you'll get over it. But if you stay away from the funeral and afterwards realize you should have gone, 
you're going to carry the burden of that guilt for a long time. And then he said to her something very insightful. He said, more importantly, this might be your opportunity to mourn for the father you never had. In other words, we have to find a way also to release that. In other words, every single person who went through the Holocaust, morally speaking, has the right to be angry for the rest of their lives. But we all know that if you know children who grew up in the households of survivors who were always angry like that, it wasn't such a pleasant experience. She has to learn how to come to grips with that. And I think that's a very, a very much a part of the process. And you're quoting a Rambam, you know, that same point that we had spoken of, that you have to tell someone that they hurt you and give them that opportunity. And we might be loath to run that risk, but you want to know something? The payoff is very worth it because usually they don't end up hurting you a second time. Usually they will be open, except maybe for the exception where it's family feuds, because family feuds tend to have their own internal histories. <laughs> By family feuds, I take it you're not talking about the television show, but... Um, <laughs> wow, that's a tough crowd. Okay, so... <laughs> so um, I want to ask a kind of a, a counseling question, something that I have learned in my own life and that I have heard in more or less articulate versions in counseling people is that many people who struggle to forgive horrible things that were done to them fear, consciously or not, that forgiving would imply that what happened to them was not wrong. It's as if forgiving would imply compromising on the justice of their cause and maybe even on their need to reassert their own dignity after feeling it has been violated. So they would rather hold on, so we would rather hold on to our indignation and our sense of justice than to forgive or let go. What, if anything, do you think is wrong with that framing? In other words, how would you talk to someone who said, if I forgive my father for what he did to me, then I'm on some level saying that it wasn't as bad as it was. How would you help that person? You have to find a way to maintain your own dignity and tell the person really of the pain. You know, look, it's a very hard problem. Somebody just called me up with this issue today and they said, what does it mean you shouldn't hate your brother in your heart? Well, one of the things classically, which is a pasuk in the Torah, it's not the chichab el don't hate your brother in your heart. And one of the ways the rabbis interestingly explain it is, is you shouldn't carry it around in your heart. You should tell the person. Uh, but this friend of mine, you know, was also saying, does that mean you can't hate anybody ever? And I said, no, I can't believe that it really means that. Because there are people who say, well, you know, you, shouldn't, you should hate the sin, but not the sinner. Okay, I think every one of us has heard that. But what exactly does that mean? Does that mean when somebody's very good, you shouldn't love them? You should love their good acts, but not them. <laughs> anyway, you know, if, you know, if we're saying... That's how I feel if, about you, Joseph. <laughs> if, no, look about it. Think about it for a moment. If we're saying that we shouldn't identify a person who's done evil things with the evil he's done, then we're saying, well, so don't just think of him as a bad person. Think of him as a, as a person who's done some bad things and just only hate the sin. But then, why should we love a good person? And ultimately, I think most of us would think, you know, would think that. So the problem I think we always encounter in the realm of forgiveness is simply this. It's like there's a law in Judaism, honor your father and mother. Every single one of us, without exception, can think of an instance where that law shouldn't be applicable. You know, a girl who's been, or a boy who's been sexually abused by a parent. Somebody would say to them, honor your father and mother. We'd say, no, it doesn't apply in that instance. And every, love your neighbor as yourself. Does it apply to every neighbor? These are general principles enunciated in the Torah. And I think we have to be able to distinguish on the forgiveness realm those that lend themselves to forgiveness, those where someone can make a real effort to undo. Because otherwise we can become self-righteous you know, about everyone. And as I said... We have a tendency to judge other people by their actions and ourselves by our intentions. And a lot of times when people have hurt us, their intentions were not necessarily malevolent. And if anybody here has been in therapy, I always assume I'm speaking to a Jewish audience, a certain number of people have been in therapy. 
are in therapy, will be in therapy, are therapists, you know, and no, we all know that more anger and there's more malevolence in, 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 in us than we think. So I think that's really what's also necessary. See, that's where it becomes problematic. Uh, and what I was going to say before about instances of not forgiving. So I quote an instance of the Reverend John Miller of Martha's Vineyard. And somebody was like, why am I picking on John Miller of Martha's Vineyard who none of us ever heard of? Because in 1997, he had an unusual experience. He was visited by the Secret Service who told him that that Sunday, President Clinton was going to be in church. So he had a very rare opportunity granted to few clergy, granted to few ministers, to few priests, to few rabbis. He knew the President of the United States was going to be a captive it was going to be in his audience. He knew he'd have one opportunity. I was going to say he'd have one shot. But he'd have one opportunity uh, to, have, you know, to have the president in his audience. And he chose to speak about forgiveness and how important it was. And then in the middle of the sermon, knowing that the president was there, I'm sure he was speaking for the whole congregation, but I'm sure he wanted to reach the president, he picked up a big photo of Timothy McVeigh, the, uh, the terrorist who bombed the federal building in Oklahoma City. 168 people were killed, 24 children. It was from Timothy McVeigh that I learned an English expression I didn't know until then. Now it's often used. He asked if he regretted the 24 children who died. He said they were collateral damage. And he picked up a photo and he said, I ask everyone here to forgive this man. And he then said, we as Christians are commanded to forgive him. Now, Clinton didn't. Clinton allowed him you know, to be executed. But but the point is, we, I think that's the whole point with love your neighbor. You, know, you, have, you have to draw distinctions. Now, the Torah doesn't say love your enemy. That is a famous teaching of Jesus. But it does say you have to treat your enemy fairly. If you come across your enemy and his animal is burdened, you have to help him lift up. Now, it's very possible, as you know, the Midrash puts it, that in the process of helping him lift up his animal, you might also stop being enemies. And you certainly can't take advantage of your being enemies to let his animals suffer. So you have to be fair. So I think that's also a distinction that we have to speak about when we speak about forgiveness. What is it that we're being asked to forgive and what might be possible limits? This might actually be a difference in Jewish and Christian theology, though you could find examples, you know, maybe that would dispute. It's always hard to make these generalizations. But this might be that we might place different limits on, on what, we, what should be forgiven and what shouldn't be. Um, I, I want to add two quick thoughts to this. One is, one is a sort of like a, a philosophical comment, which is I actually think the fact of forgiving someone implies within it the assessment and the insistence that what they did was wrong. Otherwise, what we're granting is not forgiveness. Right? So I think it's actually very important to clarify that point. Forgiveness does not mean I hereby volunteer to be a doormat. What you did doesn't matter because I have no dignity. It means something very different, which is fully acknowledging and affirming the wrongness of what you did. I am making a choice to put that down. Right? That's a different thing. Now the problem, I think, which is really the second point I want to make, is this is one of the many places you speak about people who are what I kept thinking about with Joseph's four groups of therapy is that some of us are all those at the same time. But, but the truth is, what we realize you know, a million times a day is the gap between a cognitive realization and an emotional transformation is sometimes a lifetime, right? So you can say what I just said, kind of we'll call it pretentiously a philosophical intervention. No, let me restructure the way you're thinking about what forgiveness is, and yet, Often, the part that doesn't want to forgive is an angry, abused child, right? And that sort of cognitive move is not going to be adequate. And so I think there, the question becomes, how do we help all kinds of different parts of ourselves let go of the hurt that people have? Because another way of saying this, and you kind of alluded to this before, is that, you know, getting angry or indignant is at first a reassertion of my own dignity. Over time, what it becomes is a form of poison I inflict on myself. Oh. And when that happens, right, that's really the question, like, you know, how do I avoid the reassertion of my own dignity actually turning into, over time, a form of self-destruction? That's a very hard question. I mean, it's like, that's as hard as it gets in human life. Like, I need, at first, to put it one other way, 
Forgiveness does not come instead of realizing the depth of what the other person did. It comes after it. That's a very different thing. Now, just, I want to ask, just, if I could, I want to ask you one other small question before we take some questions right. from, from um, the people who have up. sent forward. Sorry? No, no, I said that. So I, I want to share with you a passage from C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. um, C.S. Lewis, who was a deeply pious, deeply devout Christian, when he writes a book about the death of his wife, A Grief, a grief Observed, he writes searingly of the pain he experiences, and he writes the following paragraph. Where is God? Go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face, and a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that silence, you might as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. What can this mean? Not that I am, I think, in real danger of ceasing to believe in God. To believe in God. The real danger is of coming to believe such dreadful things about God. I share this because I think Lewis is a particularly eloquent version of a problem many of us struggle with, and some of us maybe even admit that we struggle with, which is a sense of disappointment and anger in God, and a struggle, anger at God, and a struggle to ask what would it mean to forgive God? Whether about personal experiences, whether about communal experiences, so what do you make of that language? What would you say to someone who came to you and said, you know, the things that happened to me, if there was a God who cared about people, the world would not exist in which that happened to me. What do I do? All of us can construct arguments of unfairnesses of God. So I want to ask a question, again, by a showing of hands. How many of you feel that in your life, by and large, you feel you've been untreated, treated unfairly in life. How many of you don't feel that? Now, I listen, I'm in no way hostile show on trying to minimize those who raise their hands. You know, I'm in no way minimizing what happened. But I also suspect that many of those of us who, who don't claim that we were necessarily treated unfairly have had Bad experience. Like a friend of mine once said, he said, if you know anybody well enough, you can uh, abstract five traits about them that make them sound like the most wonderful people in the world. By the way, rabbis know how to do that because they have to give eulogies. And, uh, and on the other hand, you can take anybody if you know them well enough and five traits that make them sound pathetic. So by and large, I don't know if it's necessarily true that people... Uh, feel it, even though there can be an intense emotion. I think a lot of the anger that gets generated against God has to do that people might not have realistic expectations about what to expect from God. Though I would admit, theologically, what most troubles me is not the Holocaust. And believe me, the Holocaust troubles me a very great deal. But the Holocaust, I believe, is ultimately revelatory about human nature. If you have a taina, if you have a complaint against God, it's that he gave human beings free will. The complaint I would have is not that God gave human beings free will, because without that we don't have any real humanity, we're, we're robotic. But it's why did he give a whole variety of either mental illnesses, which in effect deprive human beings of free will. That becomes problematic. Or for example, why did he have to implant? Why within the gradations of free will that human beings have to be created who enjoy torturing people. You can have free will, you know, you can have free will without that. That, to my mind, is, some, is the biggest challenge. Anything that potentially limits the free will, uh, the free will of human beings. And, but otherwise, this is, I end up going back to one of the credos of medieval Jewish philosophy, Lu Yadati Paiti. If I knew God, I'd be God. Uh, because otherwise, what are we going to do? And, you know, and it, there's not a consistency about it. I was talking about this subject recently with Devaru. We were talking about the fact there are people we know who lost their faith because of the Holocaust, and then there are people we know who, because of that, have a very intense faith. So it's hard to predict what will be the things that will alienate people. 
Now, everything that happened to C.S. Lewis, he wrote that in the aftermath. C.S. Lewis, late, very, not very late in life, but in his middle years, fell in love with a woman who, interestingly, had been a communist in her background, and a con or a very left-wing, and then she was a convert from Judaism to Christianity. And they had a short-lived great love, and then she died of cancer. It was, and it was terrible, and he was shattered by it. But it's very hard to know where to go with that insight, because obviously every terrible thing that then caused Lewis to have his faith shaken, he had known about before. It just hadn't happened to him personally. So we all know that, I mean, because there's horrible suffering going on right now in the world, but with, it's, like, it's like the anger issue. We read things in the newspaper that are terrible and drive us to great anger. Terrorist acts, but if we really analyze when we get most angry at other people, it's probably when they've done something to hurt us. So it's not that there's an objective basis. We're really angry because they did this or that. It doesn't necessarily cause us to lose sleep, but we'll lose sleep over the personal affront. And even with the God issue, why doesn't it, you know, we lose faith or something, you know, because of other things. Also, I don't know where to go with that, because how did Lewis, do you know from his own writings? Lewis, to say it, always a defender of Christianity. In fact, he's basically, I think, regarded as sort of the great apologist, or the great the apologist has a, can sometimes have a negative connotation. The great explainer of Christianity in the in the 20th century, and I think he found a way to reconcile. And obviously, if you love God, there are times you're going to get angry at God. It's like in any relationship, you could feel. But ultimately, I think we come back to what are realistic expectations to have of God, and how do we react uh, in that situation? How many of you feel that you do have a love for God? How many of you feel that you don't? How many of you have a fear of God? I mean, that's a big part of it. You know, people often think fear of God sounds terrible. It sounds like primitive religion. But if you look in the Torah, fear of God is used to explain a number of things. You know, what does it say about the two midwives who disobeyed Pharaoh and saved the Jewish babies? It said they feared God. It's a very, very important insight. Pharaoh was going to kill people. He wanted to kill all the Jewish babies. And the Egyptians cooperated because they feared Pharaoh. The two midwives feared God, who was above Pharaoh. So in that regard, fear you know, can be liberating. And fear, well, you shall fear God, is often used when we're dealing in the Torah with people weaker than ourselves. Don't put a stumbling block. Don't put a stumbling block in front of a blind person. You shall fear God. Because fear of God makes you realize God's going to see that person. So it's a very great help when we're dealing with people uh, who are also weaker than ourselves. And yet, what are we going to say? If, if, all, if, if whenever you acted well, if you were a good person, you never had, your socks never fell, you didn't get sick. I mean, what, what exactly, how could we structure the world differently? How could God be different in a way that could still guarantee free will without people being rewarded in this world. You know, reward is, is not granted in this world. So give me an alternate scenario of how that could, I mean, uh, yeah, right, give me an alternate. Oh, okay. Um, I wanted to maybe offer a slightly different angle and then share with you a question that comes from the floor and that I hear frequently. Um, that is something I want to just mention about Tanakh that is basically never talked about. If you open the book of Psalms, say for Tehillim, and read it without prior assumptions about what's in it, one of the things that you will find is that the book of Psalms is really unafraid of bringing to God heartbreak, anger, and a sense that God has disappointed. Right, that's what call, it's called in Bible scholarship the Psalms of Lament. We might call them Psalms of Complaint. Right? This is not a small thing in Sefer Dean. This is a pretty significant thing. And actually, I think it's a fascinating question about why it is that most of us, even many of us who spend our lives engaged in um, Torah Jewish observance, are unaware of those texts, and to the extent that we're aware of them, they make us kind of queasy. 
we have been sold, I would say, a very denuded vision of what piety looks like. Right? The psalmists actually felt that they had enough of a relationship with God that they could say, I don't get why the world is like this right now. And I'm putting it at your feet. And unlike Abraham at Sodom, who keeps apologizing for speaking up, not a single psalm of lament says, that I'm aware of, not a single one says, God, I'm really sorry I'm speaking to you this way. He says, no, I don't understand. Now, that's not a, an essay in philosophical theology. It is what it is, is the willingness to bring raw pain. And I suspect that to the extent that we have made religion about sweetness and light, and made piety about gratitude in all circumstances, no matter what, we have actually abandoned a piece of the um, religious inheritance that we have. A story I often tell, um, which because I just find it so interesting, is a friend of mine who was a rabbi of an Orthodox shul was telling me that he had three different congregants in the span of a year come to him and talk about horrific experiences. You know, being abandoned multiple times by the same man, being be uh, just really unimaginable stuff. And in all three of those conversations, he put before the congregant a psalm of lament and said, how about if you try doubting this? And all three of the people in this Orthodox shul, all of whom were completely observant in all kinds of traditional ways, said to him some version of the following thing. Are you kidding? I don't have that kind of relationship with God that I would say that. I don't believe in God like that. And so I think that in a funny way, we have been often sold a bill of goods that says if I really had faith, Right? I wouldn't have any complaints. I actually think the faith of the Psalms is very different. If I really had faith, I would actually be not so embarrassed about my pain, and I might even share it with God. Mm -hmm. um, and it says something, I think, quite complicated about us and about where we are in our relationship or non-relationship with God. We have found all kinds of substitutes for God in contemporary Jewish life. Um, so, shift for a minute and ask. Um, this question comes up all the time. Talk about what you think Judaism does or doesn't have to say about the project of forgiving oneself. I did something terrible, and I can't let go of it. Well, what about all the al hates you know, that we, that we confess to? It's an interesting thing. By the way, you know, what happens? Are you going to really change? We want to forgive people on the presumption that they're then going to be different in the future. And we presumably think we're going to be different in the future. And then one day it suddenly occurred to me, you know, you go to a traditional Jewish service and you hit against your heart. The sin I committed this, the sin I committed that. You know what, you know? Guess what? You're going to be confessing to those same sins next year, Kipper. You know, there is something a little pessimistic about the realization we're always going to fight against these things. But I think it's also important to realize that a lot of those sins, while I was looking through it now, a lot of those sins are sins that we commit even against ourselves. I'm not supposed to speak lush and her, but a lot of people really speak badly of themselves. They have this self-image of themselves. And a lot of times we have trouble letting go. And sometimes we just have to find a way to love ourselves even though we are aware of bad things that we've done, and we have to try and struggle with them. It's important, uh, what's that famous, that famous line of Eleanor Roosevelt? No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. And that's, in a sense, well, you know, we're both aware of that famous Hasidic teaching, the teaching of Rav Simcha Bunim, that you should have a piece of paper in each of your two pockets, and one should have Abraham's words, Yanochi Afar Be'efer, because I'm but dust and ashes, and the others, uh, and the other is based on a Talmudic teaching about that Lafiha, Adam was created singly to teach us that everybody should say, Bishvilin Ivraha Olam, for my sake was the world created. So I think that's what we have to, in a sense, go back and forth and acknowledge both, and then to acknowledge sometimes there are things we can't overcome. Abraham Torsky, I remember you know, reading of a case he wrote. A woman wrote him in the following problem that she had. 
She had had a cleaning woman who worked in her house, and she, she thought it was great, and people in the neighborhood were using her. And one day, from the, between the time that the cleaning woman arrived and left, no one else had been in the house, a very valuable jewel of hers uh, had disappeared, a piece of jewelry. And the woman, of course, denied having taken it. And yet there was really no other possible person who could have taken it. So not only did she fire the woman, she called up the other people who worked with that woman and got the woman fired. The woman had to end up leaving the town. About two years later, she and her husband were getting a new carpet. And when they removed the carpet, the jewel had fallen there. And she wanted to know, could she do chuba? She had done a terribly evil thing. How, you know, could she? And he said, and she made every effort to find out where the woman had gone. And Tversky said, all you guys can do now is look forward. You, sometimes there are things we've done that we can't undo. So do we then hate ourselves? We, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know where to go with that insight. But I do know that if we don't find a way to forgive ourselves, we're probably not going to be so great at forgiving other people either. We shouldn't rush uh, to forgive ourselves too quickly. But we have to also recall, it's not one of the 613 commandments, but probably the most famous of the 613 commandments is love your neighbor as yourself. The three commandments of love, what are they? Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor, and what's the third commandment of love? Stranger. I know, I want you to see how many other people. Rabbi, I know you knew it. You could just, I'll give you a different test. Name the 613. Name any 350 of the 613 commandments. In one minute. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'll give you a long one. Ten. Okay. Uh, and love the stranger. By the way, it means the ger. But remember, at the time of the Torah, ger did not mean the convert. It ger meant the stranger. He gave them, I eat them because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. But the actual original law in the Torah is love your neighbor as yourself. So the explicit command is love your neighbor. What's the implicit command? Love yourself. And that becomes... You know, a very, uh, a very important commandment. I'll just tell you, it's a great story about the Chafetz Chaim. It's indirectly related to your question, but it's a great story. Okay. <laughs> so, the Chafetz Chaim lived a very long life. He lived from 1838 to 1933. Now, my problem is I wasn't planning to tell this story, and I hope I can have all the details right in my head. Like, I don't want to give the punchline away too quickly. He lived in the last generation in history when it was possible to be famous without being widely recognized. Because photography started becoming popular in the mid-1800s, uh, but it wasn't so popular in Eastern Europe, and it definitely was not popular among religious Jews. So the Chafetz Chaim, at a young age, I think in the 1870s, wrote his first book called Chafetz Chaim Against the Laws of Lush and Hara. And uh, he was going around speaking, and everybody knew who he was, but nobody recognized him. So he's on a train going to a town to give a speech, and opposite him is sitting a man who's clearly a religious Jew. He, they talk, where are you going, why are you going into town? He said, I'm going to town to hear the Chafetz Chaim speak. He's the greatest Talmud Chacham, the greatest sage, and the greatest Tzadik, the greatest righteous man in our age. So the Chafetz Chaim was a little embarrassed at hearing himself spoken of in such grandiose terms. So he said to the man, I happen to know the Chafetz Chaim, He's not such a tzaddik. <laughs> not such a comic chacham. The other guy is enraged. You speak like that about the guy, and he slaps the chacham's time. <laughs> Meanwhile, the train pulls into the town. That night, the man goes to the speech, and he sees to his utter mortification that the guy that he gets slapped is the chacham's time. And he goes over, and he says, Rabbi, I had no idea it was you. Please forgive me. And the man said, why are you even asking for forgiveness? I have nothing to forgive you for. It was my honor you were defending. <laughs> he says, but I learned an important lesson from you. For years I've been telling people, don't speak lush and horror about others. Don't speak lush and horror about yourself. You taught me an, a person, an, an important lesson. And we have to learn that way because we can end up self-denigrating ourselves in that way. And then we have to do what we want other people to do who hurt us. Try and undo the damage we've done. Um, I'm going to add a footnote and then close the pastoral question, um, and then we'll end. Um, so for many years, I, I mean, I have to confess, I still think about this a lot, but for many years I was really preoccupied by how much the liturgy of Yamin Nuraim bothered me. 
because they, it made me think above all else, this is not the usual problem, which I also had. But it was, is God really this vain? I mean, do I really need to spend hours telling God all these amazing things about God? And I realized two things about this over time. One of which is, I actually think that the liturgy of Amin Noraim is in part about training us to say you instead of I. Right? The reason why we keep doing that is because in all kinds of reflexive ways, have you ever met someone who can say the word I in the same paragraph 147 times? Uh -huh. Have you ever been that person? We've all been that person. It's called junior year of college. Right? <laughs> no, I mean, it's, actually, it's, very, it's actually very profound, right? And, and, and there's something about training me to say you, 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 where I actually worship and focus and center myself on something that is not me. But there's another piece of this, which is really directly about what we're talking about. I think, why do we have to remind God over and over again that God is forgiving? I mean, in biblical theology, I think we have to remind God because God sometimes needs reminding of that. But for most of us, I suspect one of the problems is that we find it very hard to believe. One of the many ways we've lost God in modern Jewish culture is that we have a hard time believing that God is genuinely forgiving. And one of the things I often wonder about is, if we really believed in a God who is forgiving, would we also find it easier after tshuva to forgive ourselves? But because we're less convinced that forgiveness is as it were built into the universe, we're less sure how to let go um, of our own failings and misdeeds. I think that's a kind of it's something worth struggling with, at least at least to some extent. Um, now. I, I, I want to end, I, you know, there were many interesting questions, I'm sorry we didn't get to more of them, but I want to end with one that is, I, I'm choosing this one simply because it is clearly asked from a place of deep sadness. Um, this is all true and valid, but what do you do when you are still so hurt, disappointed, and angry that you don't want to forgive that person? And what if the person shows no indication of changing his or her behavior? I'm going to ask both of us to answer this briefly. Okay. Because it's an easy question right now. <laughs> I'm going to exclude family relationships at the moment because there you often have to maintain a relationship with someone you'd prefer not to. I am willing to write people off, and I'll tell you why. There are, I've, I've been blessed in life to meet very many fine people, people who I really like and enjoy being with. Why would I not try and spend as much of my time as possible with them and be willing to write off people who've hurt me and maybe hurt me more than once and maybe hurt me more times and who I don't have to be indissolubly, is that a word? Who I don't have to be indissolubly, I think. Indissolubly, okay, thank you. Uh, involved with. So that is a sad question, and if there's a way of extricating yourself from it, guess what? It's possible that you'll be happier if you do it, and really be conscious, you know, judge people by their actions. People, you know, people might have, might have hurt us, and if they've done it many times, the past is probably an indicator of the future. Whereas I have friends who I love deeply. I was in Israel last week. I, hang out, I hung out with five different friends, and I think back at the history, and every one of these people I've had a relationship with for over 30 years. And guess what? I can think of almost no instances in which they ever hurt me. So we can make, I think, more intelligent choices. I don't know if that sounds like a pre Yom Kippur message. It might sound a little unforgiving. Okay. Um, I think that... I, I actually want to say something that maybe should be obvious, but isn't always, that the real response to this question is to ask the person to tell their story, right? Because like in so many questions like this, once you abstract them, you lose the sheer human reality of what a person has been through. But I wanna, I wanna just sort of suggest two kind of quick things about this. One is, what I might say in that circumstance is let's not talk about forgiveness at all right now. Let's talk about what it would mean for you to put down the rage that you carry such that you could free yourself. You know, one of the things I have to confess I have found very troubling about many moral philosophers who write on forgiveness, especially religious ones, is that they'll say, you know, if forgiveness is not about reconciliation, 
then I don't even know if it's forgiveness at all. And it has no, many Christian writers will say, it has no religious value. To which my response in all honesty is, we come from a tradition that deeply, deeply values human liberation. And the ability to put down a grudge so that I can live more freely is not the end of religious life, because religious life is not just about me, but it is also about achieving a certain degree of inner freedom. So if forgiveness is not the right language or is not a possibility, I think what I might begin by talking about is, is it possible to find some path to greater freedom? Because otherwise I remain in prison. You know, it reminds me of this actually, I'm violating my own rule, but it's an amazing story that it was, appeared in a self-help magazine I read in my psychologist's office many years ago. Um, <laughs> By the way, once in your career as a rabbi on the Upper West Side, you have to say that sentence, right? So, two veterans are standing at the Vietnam Memorial. One of them says to the other, were you a POW too? Guy says, yeah. First guy says, how long did they have you for? He says, five years. Really, five years, me too. Have you forgiven them? He says, are you kidding? Forgive those bastards, I'm never gonna, never. First guy says, wow. I guess they still have you. And there's something actually very proud of that. And again, I'm not sure forgiveness has to be the right language there. But let's call it putting down in some way. Um, I want, yeah, you finish. I want to make a um, very brief comment. Okay. okay. Um, and that's really the question of is there an inherent value in the work of going inside to free myself? And it's and always in Judaism, it is not just to free myself so that I can be different. It is also and always to free myself so that I can enter into a relationship more deeply. Right? God never says to the Jewish people, repent so that you can hang out and feel better. God says, repent so that we can love each other again. That doesn't mean loving that person again. I, I don't think it means that in every circumstance. I want to be clear. But it does mean that one of the things that freedom makes possible, this is going to be a sort of crazy sentence, freedom makes possible freedom. The capacity to enter into other relationships. The capacity not to see the person who hurt me in every other person I try to trust. The capacity not to see my ex-husband in the person I'm dating. Right? Freedom makes possible an ability to relate in other situations more deeply. Sometimes freedom makes possible an ability to re-engage and reconcile. Sometimes, as I said repeatedly, I don't think that's desirable, let alone possible. Or, right? Um, but there is always the religious value of liberation. And that's not an easy path. And it requires a tremendous amount, I think, of compassion for oneself through that process. The final word. Okay, now I just wanted to say one thing. Shai, when you started responding to the last comment, you said we don't know enough about the situation of the person who wrote that letter. And I really do want to, I actually want to apologize to that person because I realized what I said could have come across as dismissive. And I don't know what the situation was that they were dealing with. And it probably involved something. I still hold by what I said. I try as much as possible to fill my life with people with whom I don't have complicated relationships. But, you know, because life, though, is very complicated. It reminds me, I wrote a book years ago on Jewish humor, and basically whenever people come to tell me jokes, I usually heard them in one form or another. But I actually heard a new joke recently. I heard it from Gary Rosenblatt, the editor of the Jewish Week. And it just reflects the complexity of the world. In the early days of Israel, when it wasn't that common to have major leaders coming over, flying over, a big leader from Israel comes over to the United States, he's met by a delegation at the airport, and somebody says to him, so what's the situation like in Israel? Tell me in one word. The man says, good. <laughs> and then somebody else calls out, okay, you can expand, tell us in two words. He says, not good. <laughs> Um, if you could just take a moment before you get out of your seats, we're going to let our speakers exit around the back. 
um, so that they could be in place for, for the book signing. In the meantime, I have some very important and entertaining information that I want you to hear. So, okay. um, first of all, I also want to thank all of the McCona Guard staff. Too many to mention who really made this night possible. I want you to take a look at the source sheet that you have. If you turn it over to the back, you will see there is a list of classes that you're all welcome to join, and I would invite you to do that. May I just have your attention for one more moment, please? We are two postcards that you've all been looking at, I'm sure, during the um, less insulating moments. The yellow one is the, is the one that I want you to pay attention to, which is if you want to take a class with Rabbi Shai Hill online about the Book of Psalms, you can do it through this online learning project that we have called Project Zoo. If you want to come in person to any number of events, including more, conversa more conversations with Rabbi Shai Hill, you should come, but don't come here, because we won't be here. This is Lincoln Square Synagogue. We're next door at the West End Synagogue on 190 Amsterdam. Come for all of these programs. Um, I want to say two other last things. Number one, this is the time of year when Jews feel priced out when they come to synagogue. This event costs $5 if you registered in advance. And it's very important to us at Mechon Adar that anybody who wants to come and learn can afford to do so. We did not break even on this event. And so, if anybody has the means to supplement the $5, there's some envelopes on your way out. And the last, a gift for you on your way out, is a number of uh, content stacks, uh, some debrief tour about the high holidays for myself and some of my colleagues that you're welcome to take. Thank you again for being here. Good night.